Welcome to you all. I'm going to tell you today about quantum mechanics. That's the objective of today's uh, video. And so we'll start with the reason why. Why am I going to tell you about quantum mechanics? Well, uh, in the past year, the past couple of years, we've witnessed an extraordinary situation where quantum mechanics and computation are coming together and they're giving birth to quantum computation. And not just theoretically, the first uh, real world uh, devices that are capable of performing quantum computation have been developed. They are now available. And this has generated an extraordinary amount of excitement, um, both inside physics, but also outside physics. And the reason I'm going to tell you about quantum mechanics today is because I have in mind that, the, that you who are participating in this video and people watching this video will be people who are not necessarily physicists. So the, the aim of today's uh, video is to gently give you a background, enough background in quantum mechanics so that you could potentially uh, jump in to the field of quantum computation. And so uh, I should then move to the who. Who do I have in mind for today? So today's uh, uh, presentation is not really intended for physicists who know everything there is to know about quantum mechanics. That's not the objective of today's video. The people who I have in mind are people who are trained at an undergraduate level in a natural science, potentially information theory, potentially uh, 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 chemistry or some other related field, biology, where you've, you've had some exposure to a little bit of mathematics, a little bit of physics, but not necessarily quantum mechanics at all. So this is the target audience for today. People who are knowledgeable of maths and perhaps physics at an undergraduate level, but who haven't seen quantum mechanics. So if you have seen quantum mechanics, maybe you'll be curious to see what, how I'll be presenting quantum mechanics to a general audience. But the, the audience today is not physicists. It's really for people who, who have really barely any uh, working knowledge of, of quantum physics. Uh, what do I presume? What do you need to bring what to, to understand um, today's video? Um, I'm going to, you know, you're going to need to bring two, two ingredients um, in order to best benefit from today's video. So the first thing you're going to need to do is bring a basic, I repeat, basic uh, working knowledge of probability theory. Uh, so I will assume, and I won't bother to define notions such as probability distribution, expected value, average value, sample space, uh, random variable. These notions will be assumed. And if you're uncomfortable with these notions, then please do a go ahead and look at uh, uh, the numerous videos that are available actually on YouTube and beyond that will give you a good grounding in probability theory. So probability theory is really a must for, for enjoying the, the content for today. Uh, another must uh, is linear algebra. So linear algebra is a more demanding prerequisite uh, it's, and it's something I'm just going to assume. So I do uh, encourage you, if you're not comfortable with linear algebra, maybe to take a little while to review the basic, uh, uh, the basic concepts of linear algebra. In particular, it's, it's going to be essential that you know the notion of, of a vector space. Okay, that's the, the basic part of linear algebra. I, I also will assume you know about matrices. I, I'll assume that you know about diagonalization of matrices. Um, there's one potentially advanced topic that you may not be familiar with, and that's the Kronecker or tensor product. Uh, I will partially review this. Uh, that's something you do need to have fair, fairly, need to be fairly comfortable with, and hopefully you will be by the end of this video anyway. So why are we here? To teach you quantum mechanics. Who's this aimed at? people with a broad scientific background who at least are comfortable with probability theory and linear algebra. And uh, well, let's get right to it. So what I'm going to do is present to you quantum mechanics, but I'm not going to teach you all of quantum mechanics. That takes a full semester uh, at, the, at the end of an undergraduate degree. I'm going to tell you about not quantum mechanics, but I'm going to tell you about something that we could call simplified quantum mechanics. Now, uh, I'll try and be uh, very precise about what is being simplified here and what you're missing out on and what you're gaining. 
So to teach quantum mechanics properly, you do need a good grounding in all of physics so you can sort of place the, the theory of quantum mechanics in context. And that takes many, many years of an undergraduate degree. However, uh, and further, you need to be comfortable, uh, it, you need to really engage with infinite dimensions to do quantum mechanics as a physical theory justice. Now, these two, two prerequisites usually mean that quantum mechanics is incredibly hard to learn um, because, okay, it may be easy to, to, to learn uh, probability theory and linear algebra, but the minute you talk about infinite dimensional vector spaces and uh, fitting this all in the context of a, of a broader uh, theory of physics, that places a massive uh, hurdle to, to, to uh, entry, a massive barrier to entry when learning quantum mechanics. However, it turns out that for the purposes of quantum computers, learning about enough quantum mechanics to understand how quantum computers operate, or at least how to model quantum computers, you don't need to know about infinite dimensional vector spaces. This is not required. And you don't really lose anything by not knowing that part of the, the, the quantum canon. And secondly, you, if you're willing to accept a couple of postulates on faith, you don't actually need to know the full baggage of all the historical development of quantum mechanics and other physical theories on which the development of quantum mechanics was built. So this is, the, this is why uh, uh, we can teach the elements of quantum mechanics without this huge barrier to entry, the price we pay is that you're not going to quite learn about quantum mechanics as uh, practiced by practitioners, uh, but you will learn enough that you really will be able to do almost all the calculations that we do in our daily, daily lives as quantum information theorists. You should be able to follow them with a, at a professional level after today's lecture. And uh, that's, that's why that's where we're going to jump off from now. The idea that I'm going to teach you quantum mechanics, not the full theory with infinite dimensions, rather a simplified subset that's self-contained and will allow you to reason about quantum computers. And before moving on um, to, 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 the, to telling you what is quantum mechanics, because I am going to tell you all the postulates of quantum mechanics, we're going to learn how to work with quantum mechanics. Uh, I'm going to first mention... Uh, by way of introduction, what kind of thing is quantum mechanics? And then we'll see how to, to define it and to work with it. So the important take home message that you should already be memorizing for the future is that quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory. I'll tell you exactly what that means in the sequel. A probabilistic theory. What does this mean? It means quantum mechanics su supplies us predictions. It's a theory of physics. We model physical systems and we solve our models and we use our models to supply predictions. So that's what a predictive physical theory does. But these predictions don't come in the form of the particle will be here at this time. No, the predictions of quantum mechanics come in the form of probabilities. So all that quantum mechanics can do as a theory is give you a probability of an event taking place. So the predictions come in the form of probabilities. And well, the minute you have probabilities, you need probability theory to reason about it. And in that sense, that's why probability theory is a necessary prerequisite to talk about quantum mechanics, because at some point, uh, quantum mechanics is going to hand you a prediction, it's going to be a probability, and you're going to have to reason about it. Now, to give you a high-level depiction of how a probabilistic theory, what does it look like, you know, how do you work with a probabilistic theory, I'm going to show you every single experiment that mankind has ever done in physics. So the way an experiment works is you have three stages in an experiment. There are, uh, there's a preparation stage where you build up your apparatus and you put the apparatus into a known state or a known um, configuration. So this is the first stage of any experiment in physics, preparation. You start by building your system up and setting up all the, the, the degrees of freedom in known configurations so that you can then proceed. You then allow your system depicted here as a line, to 
to evolve. Maybe you, you change some aspects of it. Maybe you, you shine some laser light at it and then you turn the laser off or something. So what happens is that after preparation, there is a period of so-called dynamics. Some time passes, things happen. And then at the end of the experiment, you measure, you perform a measurement. So there's, oops. And a measurement supplies us information. And this information will typically come in the list of a bunch of bits of information. So we have, say, classical bits. So to, if, if you're sort of like struggling to imagine something that fits into this, imagine we have um, some mirrors. We shine some very faint light into this collection of mirrors. These, uh, the light bounces around the mirrors. And then we have a photon detector somewhere, something that just detects light. And this detector just clicks or doesn't click. Now, that's actually a surprisingly good representation for, uh, for very many, um, uh, uh, very many uh, situations in experimental physics. And, and the information you get when you measure light in, with, or in particular, is a photon there or not, is a click or a no click. In fact, it turns out that all the observables that quantum mechanics will give you predictions about are of that form. Does event A happen or not happen? So that's why probability theory uh, will play a role. Uh, in terms of preparation here, usually there's some information required to describe the preparation of your, your experiment. So we have a list of of, of variables a1 through to am. These are also classical bits. You can just take your information that describes the setup of your apparatus and express it as a list of bits as well. So what you should be seeing here is a picture where classical information is used to create a preparation for your, your, your experiment. The experiment proceeds and then there's a measurement and out comes classical information. And so that's, uh, that's all, all experiments uh, that we try and describe in physics take roughly, uh, if you work hard enough, they, you can sort of reduce them to this abstract form here. And so the goal of quantum mechanics is to describe the probability that we get a given outcome given a certain income. So this is the predict the probability, because we can't, uh, quantum mechanics will not, will only deliver probabilities as, our, as, as predictions um, of an outcome x1 through to xn, so you get some string of bits, given the setup uh, a1 through to a m. So, you know, we have something like this, given A1 through to AM. That's all that quantum mechanics, that's the goal of quantum mechanics, to do this. And what I'm about to tell you now is I'm going to give you a recipe book. You can take this recipe book and with a bit of practice and uh, uh, just a little bit of extra knowledge, you'll be able to apply this recipe book to model an extraordinarily large number of systems that occur in quantum computation. So that's the goal of quantum mechanics and also our goal today. That's all very well, you might say. You know, we have these probabilities. Great. Um, I, you know, you, you, you might be forgiven for thinking this all looks too abstract. And the, and the answer is indeed it does look too abstract because I haven't told you what's the rules for preparation. What's the rules of uh, predicting the dynamics or modeling the dynamics of an experiment? And what's the rules for getting measurement outcomes out of a quantum system? That's the goal for today, to tell you what the rules are uh, to allow you to pr produce one of these probabilities as an outcome, as a prediction. And that brings us to simplified quantum mechanics. If you are a German speaker, then you can benefit from my latest uh, lecture series, Theoretical Physics C, in which I go into much more detail uh, about the laws of quantum mechanics. I give the full postulates, no, 
no simplifying assumptions whatsoever. Um, but also I can recommend any number of, of videos that you might find uh, or, uh, on the internet. Uh, you know, the essentials of quantum, uh, uh, any lecture course on quantum mechanics will give you some version of what I'm about to show, uh, some superset of the version of, of what I'm about to show. Right. Oh, it occurs to me that before I jump into these postulates, I should have a couple of words about notation. Indeed. Just so that you won't be too shocked when I start writing down things. Uh, so we're going to talk about vector spaces a lot in quantum mechanics. And we're going to talk about something called Hilbert spaces. So uh, le let me just set some notation. I'm going to... The vector spaces that occur in simplified quantum mechanics all have a very special form. They are all the form of the complex numbers to the, to the D, which means this is just the vector space of all um, uh, column vectors with, with D entries, D complex numbers. So hopefully you're, you're familiar and comfortable with complex numbers. I didn't write that as a prerequisite, but um, that is something that I'll also assume that you know. So vectors in, in my, my notation, vectors are usually written with a V with a line underneath to indicate that there's a vector. So it's a column vector with D complex entries. So that's our vector spaces in simplified quantum mechanics. We'll always be focusing on these kind of things. We also have uh, in simplified quantum mechanics, an inner product. That's also pretty important uh, to talk about this inner product. As we'll see, it's got to do with the probabilities of quantum mechanics. Inner products, I will have various notations for them, but this is the one that we'll stick to. VW, an inner product. The inner product we're going to use is going to be take the transpose of V, then take the complex conjugate, which we could also write as star, and multiply it by W. That's the inner product we're going to use when talking about simplified quantum mechanics. And so just a quick example, just to set this notation. If we have one vector V and this vector is like one I, and we have another vector W, and this vector is like two I three. So these are two vectors in, in, in the vector space V is C two, right? two column vectors. Then their inner product can be calculated, and we're going to need to do this, uh, as follows. Well, we've got to take the transpose of V and then the complex conjugate. So here's the transpose of V, but I haven't done the complex conjugate yet. Now I'll do the complex conjugate. So 1 stays goes to 1, but I goes to minus I, and we've got 2I and 3. And then at the end, we end up with 2I minus 3I, which is otherwise known as minus I. So that's the inner product between V and W, we're going to use, use this inner product uh, a lot. Um, it's a so-called sesquilinear bilinear form. Um, you don't need to know that. You, if you're just uh, happy to accept this definition, then that's something we're going to use a lot. Good. Let's move on. Uh, I think that's all I need to say about vector spaces. Oh, yeah, I have to tell you one final thing. It's going to come up a lot. It's hard to talk about quantum mechanics without saying the word Hilbert space. Now, Hilbert spaces are in infinite dimensions, a much more subtle concept than they are in finite dimensions. Uh, but in finite dimensions, life is very easy, and that's why we take finite dimensional systems. Um, a, a Hilbert space is nothing other than a vector space uh, V with this inner product VW. Okay. That's what a Hilbert space is for today. Um, that's enough for us in simplified quantum mechanics. If you wanted to do it properly, then you have to worry about infinite dimensional uh, systems. We're not going to do that. Uh, so we, it's enough for us to focus on finite dimensions. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to list a bunch of postulates. Now the thing about quantum mechanics is that you can't prove that quantum mechanics is correct. In physics, you can't prove anything is correct. All you can do in physics is reject a hypothesis, right? So we can't say 
we have proved with this experiment that quantum mechanics is correct. All we have done is supplied evidence that it might be correct when we do an experiment and it, the, the, the outcome of the experiment matches what we would predict from quantum mechanics. This is a serious, uh, 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 this is a, a serious component of physics. You can never prove that a theory is correct. All you can do is reject hypotheses and therefore sort of accumulate evidence that this theory is the correct one. It could be that tomorrow someone does an experiment which uh, indicates that there's a theory that's not quantum mechanics that matches all the experiments we've done up to now, um, but uh, in some way goes beyond quantum mechanics. I can't exclude that possibility. It's impossible to exclude the possibility that there's another theory underlying everything that's uh, uh, different from quantum mechanics. And so uh, that's why we can't, I can't say to you, uh, this is, you can derive this. What we've done is through many decades of experience, accumulated evidence that a certain mathematical structure seems to model the, the, the universe. And the best way we have to describe this mathematical structure is via a list of postulates. And uh, the, the word postulate should indicate to you, this is something I can't prove. It's something we take on faith, uh, or, or rather not completely on faith, like we've worked pretty hard um, to convince ourselves that these postulates are the correct way to quantify or to describe this theory. Okay, postulate one. And oh, there's always some argumentation in the literature, what's the right postulates. I'm gonna show you the real uh, professional postulates. I'm not really pulling my punches here. This, this, this list of postulates are the ones that many working physicists work with uh, in, their in their daily job. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how we really work with uh, quantum states. This, will, this is where these list of postulates might differ from a, the average textbook, which sort of presents things in a slightly indirect way. Okay, postulate one. Each type of quantum system is assigned a Hilbert space H. Okay, I'll immediately do an example to give you an example. So, we are assigning a Hilbert space to each type of quantum system. Let me give you an example of a type of quantum system. We're doing quantum computation here today. The most fundamental atomic type of quantum system in quantum computation is the quantum bit or qubit, and that is assigned the Hilbert space C2, the, Hil the space of all column vectors with two complex entries. That, uh, this, is, this Hilbert space you shouldn't think of is directly uh, uh, leading to any predictions in quantum mechanics, rather it's the kind of uh, mathematical space upon which the structure of quantum mechanics is built. So that's, uh, it's, it's the, the background set in which quantum mechanics takes place. So the qubit is one type of quantum system that you might encounter in quantum computation. You might encounter the qdit. As the name suggests, the qdit is a D-level quantum system. It's a, and it's assigned uh, the Hilbert space or vector space within a product C to the D. So this is just the space of all column vectors with D entries. Okay. That's postulate one. Each type of quantum system is assigned a Hilbert space H. You're not allowed to go to postulate two until you've decided uh, on postulate one. And then we move to postulate two. Postulate two tells us about preparation processes. So I'm going to go back up here. Remember, every experiment in physics that takes the form of a sequence of a preparation, some dynamics and a measurement. So I have to tell you how we describe preparations in quantum mechanics. A preparation is characterized by something called a state. Now, in quantum information theory and in quantum full quantum mechanics, a state uh, is 
represented by a thing called a density matrix. I'll tell you what that is in a second. So all preparations in quantum mechanics are represented, uh, are characterized by things called states, and states are represented by density matrices. What is a density matrix? This is, and this is where we get to probably the hardest mathematical prerequisites for this course immediately. Um, what is a density matrix? This is a uh, positive operator. I'll explain what that is in a second. A matrix, right? When I say operator, always replace it with the word matrix. It could be that I just end up saying operator without thinking, um, but in simplified quantum mechanics, operator equals matrix. So I'll just put that as a parenthetic remark here. Operator um, equals matrix in simplified quantum mechanics. You can add that to the dictionary of, of terminology that you'll face. So a preparation is characterized by a state or a density matrix. This is a positive matrix, explain what that is, with trace equal to one. Okay, what's a positive matrix? So I'll tell you what the matrix is. We almost always use the symbol rho for this matrix and uh, rho uh, with trace of rho equals one. All right, this is, in, in, in a sense, this is the hardest mathematical step in understanding simplified quantum mechanics. We have to make sense of the, the, the word positive. What does this mean? Uh, so we'll just make an aside. Positive. This means that all eigenvalues of rho are uh, greater than or equal to zero. That's one characterization of positivity in finite dimensions. Another one is equivalent. And this is an exercise for you. Um, just as um, for all, if you take your favorite vector, uh, for all vectors in the vector space V, oh, I should tell you one more thing in notation in a second. Um, if you multiply this vector by the transpose complex conjugate by rho, by V, that's always greater than zero. I didn't tell you how big this matrix was, that's embarrassing. Um, it's a D by D matrix. Why is it a D by D matrix? What I should have told you is that uh, this, this matrix acts on our Hilbert space. Yeah, um, rho maps from the Hilbert space to the Hilbert space. So it's a square matrix, and if our Hilbert space has dimension D, then, uh, right, all, it turns out that all Hilbert spaces in simplified quantum mechanics are of the form of the, the complex numbers of D by D column vectors, uh, 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 D column vectors of complex numbers in quantum mechanics then um, a positive matrix is a matrix, so it's got to have the right dimension, right? It's going to be a D by D matrix. And positive means that no matter what vector you choose in your Hilbert space, H, no matter what vector you choose, if you do V transpose complex conjugate multiplied by rho multiplied by V, then that's always greater than or equal to zero. Now we have another symbol for V transpose complex conjugate. It gets so annoying to write that all the time. So we actually have a different symbol for that that I'm going to start using called V dagger rho V. It's bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, that's just an aside. What does positive mean? It means if you work out all the eigenvalues, they're either they're all greater than or equal to zero, or no matter what vector you choose from your Hilbert space, if you form this product of a vector, a row vector matrix, column vector, it's always greater than or equal to zero. Okay, very good. Um, let's do an example. Uh, no, let's not do an example. Let's finish the postulate. Uh, because there's a special case that, that you have to be aware of uh, because we're going to say these words a lot. Now, not all states are somehow the same. Some states are purer than other states. 
the terminology uh, that we use for uh, such special states is pure state. A pure state is one that cannot be prepared as a, as a, a probabilistic mixture of two other states. We'll come more to that in a minute. Um, for pure states, uh, those are represented um, as a one-dimensional projectile. And that will need some comment, and I will give some comment about that in, the, in a minute. So uh, the, the, that means that your state rho is called pure. If you can write rho as a product of a column vector and a rho vector in this way. Okay, I'll do some examples to illustrate this postulate in a second. So let's put the whole postulate there. A preparation in quantum mechanics, simplified quantum mechanics, is characterized by a state. A state is a density matrix. This is a positive matrix row which acts on our Hilbert space and has trace one. And specifically for so-called pure states, row has a special form. It's the form of a one-dimensional projector, uh, row equals psi, psi dagger. And so in other words, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between one-dimensional projectors and vector, uh, uh, otherwise known as pure states, and vectors in our Hilbert space. Let's, give an, let's do some examples. We're going to go back to qubits here. OK, this the qubit is a type of quantum system. The Hilbert space we assign to a qubit is C2. Now, I'm telling you there's a thing called a preparation, and a preparation is represented by a density matrix. So what's a density matrix? Well, it's going to be a 2 by 2 matrix, right? It's acting on H and giving us something in H. So it's got to be the only thing that fits, right, is a 2 by 2 matrix. And here's an example of a density matrix. It's got the entry a half here, the entry a half here, and the entry a quarter here times I, and an entry a quarter minus times I here. Uh, that's our first example of a quantum state. It's a 2 by 2 matrix. Let's check all the properties. Um, does it have trace 1? So are we allowed to call this a quantum state? Is the, is, the, is the first question. A quantum state has to have trace 1. OK, let's check that. So if you take the trace of rho, then you get a half plus a half. So that's 1. So that worked out. But now we have to also decide if this matrix is positive. That means uh, both eigenvalues greater than or equal to 0. Um, I'm going to take a sneaky side trick to prove that. Uh, one way to do this is you look at the determinant of the matrix. This only works in two dimensions, by the way, for qubits. Um, and the answer we get here is a quarter minus AD minus BC. Yeah? So that's a sixteenth um, uh, times by minus 1, because we've got I there, the complex number I. So uh, uh, we get a plus 16, right? If I did it correctly. Did I do it correctly? One quarter plus, oh, I'll just do it slowly. The problem with doing things quickly with too many I's on the board is that you miss a minus sign. And I think I did. So there's a minus, goes to a plus here, and there's a minus here. Okay, I did miss a minus sign. So it's a quarter minus a sixteenth. Now that number, whatever, if you care to work it out, is, is greater than zero, right? And the determinant of a matrix is the product of its eigenvalues. So we know that in this very special case here, the two eigenvalues of, of rho, their product is positive, which means that they have to either both be negative or both be positive. In this case, they are both positive because the trace is equal to 1. And that's the sum of the eigenvalues. Uh, the, you may not remember these little linear algebra tricks. Um, and the reason I'm actually doing the example like this is this, this kind of reasoning, especially about qubit states, gets applied in practice very rapidly by practitioners. You'll often see practitioners say things like, oh, that matrix is clearly positive. And you'll be like, hmm, I didn't work out the eigenvalues. How do you know that? And the, the way people reason is they often use um, uh, these kind of linear algebra side tricks. No? that the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues of a matrix that determines the product of the eigenvalues. And that way you can reason very rapidly about 
uh, matrices. And so I don't expect you to see this as obvious. On the contrary, you may be uh, you know, really struggling to remember where you saw this for the first time. That's okay, um, but by repeating these kinds of reasonings, you'll get practice at them. Okay, that's an example of a quantum state. It turns out it's not pure. And the, re the reason we're gonna, we can say that so very quickly um, is that the eigenvalues of a pure uh, state represented by a, a matrix like this um, has, has one eigenvalue equal to one and the rest equal to zero. And that would mean that the determinant is zero. So I'm gonna give you an example now of a pure state. Um, let's see if I can just think one up. Here's one. This is a pure state. Now, how could we convince ourselves of this fact? Well, think about this trick I showed above. The determinant of rho is zero. So that's a good starting point. Um, it's positive because the trace is one. Um, and, but this doesn't tell us immediately that the state is uh, pure. Pure means that rho is a matrix which has specifically this form where you can write it as a column vector times by a rho vector. And I'm going to do that right now. You can write rho in this form here, root 2, 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. So you can always write rho like this, the product of this column vector times by this rho vector. This always kind of freaks, there's a kind of freak out moment when you see this, this thing here. How can you multiply this? Well, you can, you know, according to the rules of multiplying matrices, the 1, 1 entry is... Is, uh, is a half, right? And then the rules say, well, then I take the, this entry and I multiply it by over there, and then I get a half. And then I take this one, and I get a half. And so you build a matrix that way, right? So it's, it's a matrix. It also has the form of psi times by psi dagger. So it's a one-dimensional projector, or otherwise known as a pure state. Now it's also time for another observation. We're going to need a lot. What about the, it, it, suppose we have a pure state. And pure states feature a lot in quantum computation. Uh, do, can any vector give us a pure state? And the answer turns out to be no. Uh, if you take the trace of rho, then, uh, well, you, you're taking the trace of a column vector times by a row vector, and you can use the cyclic rule of trace, right? Trace of AB is the same as the trace of BA, even when the, the matrices aren't square. So A is psi and B is psi dagger, and you get psi dagger times by psi, and that's a number, so that number has to equal one. So not any old vector is allowed as a uh, pure state, the vector further, not any other vector psi from your Hilbert space is allowed as a pure state, the vector must further have length one. And uh, another way of writing that is that the inner product between psi and itself is one. That's a quick side remark. So you'll often see in quantum mechanics textbooks, you know, people will define pure states first. They won't talk about density matrices at all. They'll say pure states are, are vectors in Hilbert space with length one. Now that's something that, uh, uh, many textbooks do, I uh, encourage you not to think this way because in reality, in quantum computation, uh, we will encounter generically and universally density matrices. We will encounter so-called mixed states, non-pure states. These, these appear uh, most generally in quantum uh, systems because every quantum system has the, is under the influence of noise and when you have noise acting on a quantum system, then that takes a system in a pure state to a mixed state. I don't expect you to understand that that uh, that statement, but at, I will have it said that, I'll just say it, uh, quantum systems in the presence of fluctuations and noise from the environment generically are not in pure states. And so that's why we should just rip the band-aid off quickly and define states as we do in simplified quantum mechanics to be matrices. And then pure states are just a special kind. Okay, there's one further example of a state that you should definitely know. 
And that is if you have a probability distribution, and this is how you can take your knowledge about probability theory and upgrade it to a knowledge about quantum mechanics. If you have a probability distribution um, on a sample space of D things, D items, then, you know, what's a probability distribution on a sample space of D items? Well, it's a list of numbers, right? It's P1, the probability that I get item 1, probability 2, and so on, all the way up to probability D. Um, and these probabilities, in order to be a probability distribution, you should be able to sum them up and get 1, otherwise it's not a probability distribution. And furthermore, the other defining feature of a probability distribution is that these numbers are all greater than or equal to 0. Now, if you have, so given a probability distribution, then that actually automatically gives you a density matrix or state. We get a valid quantum state representing this. And what do you do is you take these probabilities and you stick them on the diagonal of a matrix. So all the other entries are zero, except for um, the diagonals, which are just these probabilities. Is this a valid quantum state? Well, let's check, right? According to the definition, it has to have trace equal to one, and the eigenvalues have to be uh, greater than or equal to zero. And so let's check that. Well, the trace equal to one, that's perfect, right? That's just the sum of the diagonal entries, which is exactly what you need for these, these numbers to form a probability distribution. And the eigenvalues being greater than or equal to zero, well, that's also straight away given to us because the matrix is diagonal. So the diagonal entries are the eigenvalues. And they're all greater than or equal to zero because this is a probability distribution. So we, also, we automatically can embed probability theory into quantum mechanics. And I find that to be um, a really helpful uh, device if you're struggling to under understand quantum mechanics and have a reason about it. You can gain a lot by just thinking about how probability theory um, is a sub-theory of quantum mechanics. You get this sub-theory by just focusing on diagonal density operators. So I'll write that down. And that's really handy to know this, that probability theory is a sub-theory of quantum mechanics. So anything you can do in probability theory, you can, it turns out you can do in quantum mechanics. It's uh, very useful, perhaps, when designing algorithms. OK, I've told you about preparations that took a while. Now let me tell you about measurements. I'm going to tell you about the last bit, dynamics last. Uh, the middle bit, dynamics last. So postulate three tells us how to model detectors. So I've told you how to model in quantum mechanics preparations, namely with these density matrices. And, but in quantum mechanics, we can't perceive states. This is something very important. If you have some quantum system and you've prepared it very nicely in a given dense state represented by a density matrix, we can't see this density matrix, right? We, uh, you know the system's prepared, but you have no information about the, the, the state itself. How do you get information out of a quantum system? And the answer is by detection with a detector. And that's what I'm going to tell you about now. So a detector is a measuring apparatus. And it's a very specific kind of measuring apparatus. It's got only two possible outcomes, this measuring device. It either says yes or no. So yes, uh, otherwise known as uh, click. So the detector clicks and says, yes, I detected something. Or no, which means no click. Detectors are these very special kinds of measuring apparatuses. They exist everywhere in, in high energy physics and in optics. A detector is, a, you can think of a detector as a particle detector. You know, it, it tells if there's a photon there or not. Yes or no. Uh, and it turns out that all measurements in quantum mechanics can be uh, uh, broken down into a sequence of yes-no questions. It's kind of a binary search thing. If you want to model a, a much more complex measurement in quantum mechanics, then ultimately it's like a game of 20 questions. You know, is the 
quantity on the left or the right, yes or no. So that's the first detector. So you can model all detectors in quantum mechanics really via this postulate. All you have to do is sequentially um, uh, uh, model each yes, no, uh, uh, model the measurement as a sequence of yes, no questions, which are then separately modeled by these detectors. Now, um, that's what a detector is. Uh, uh, how is it modeled in quantum mechanics? How do we, we mathematically model such a thing? Is modeled by uh, an operator, in other words, a matrix. This matrix is going to be D by D matrix because we're acting on a D by D dimensional Hilbert space. Um, and uh, what kind of matrices are allowed? Well, only ones that obey this curious looking um, inequality. I'll explain what that means now. What does this mean? It means that F is bigger than zero or positive and that F is less than uh, the identity, which I'll explain. So what does this mean? This means that uh, zero is less than f, i.e. f is positive, and I told you what that meant earlier, and that um, f is less than equal to i. i is the identity matrix, one, 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 all zeros. Uh, and f is less than i is the same as saying that zero is less than i minus f, or um, I minus F as a matrix is also positive. That's what it means. And that's how we model detectors in quantum mechanics. Detectors are modeled by matrices F. And I better give you an example. So we have the running example of the qubit. Here's a real world example uh, detector, one that if you go on a cloud quantum computing service like the one provided by IBM, you will absolutely be able to measure this detection uh, or uh, measuring apparatus. So here's a matrix, F is given by one, zero, zero, zero. I claim that that's a legal detector. This is called the Sigma Z measurement in the, the parlance of quantum computation later, you'll see that this is called the sigma z measurement. F is this two by two matrix. So if you do a sigma z measurement, um, that means you model it with this matrix here. You'll see many of these um, as the weeks go by. Here's another one. Mm. I gotta be a touch careful here. No, I think this is correct. This is called a sigma x measurement. This terminology uh, his, is largely historical and we're kind of stuck with it. So to, uh, let's take a look. Is this thing here an allowed measurement? Okay, F has got to obey these inequalities, right? F is gonna be positive and one minus F is also gonna be positive in order for it to be called, uh, uh, in order for it to model a detection. Now let's just check F is indeed positive, right? Because its eigenvalues are one and zero and they're both greater than or equal to zero. So that's okay. What about one minus F? Well, um, we can work that out. One minus F is the identity matrix minus F, which is one zero, um, which is the same as zero one. Okay, that's also positive, right? Because the eigenvalues are zero and one. What about this next one? Same story, right? We already know that F is positive because I actually used a matrix up above, yeah, I've already proved that rho is positive. Uh, it turns out f is the same as rho. It, that does sometimes happen, but is not usually the case. In this case, it does happen. Um, f uh, is positive, but what about one minus f, right? Might not be positive. One, one, zero, zero, minus a half, a half, a half, a half, is equal to a half, a half, minus a half, minus a half. Now the question is, does this matrix have positive eigenvalues? And the answer is yes, right? If you work out the determinant, you can see that you get a positive number, right? The determinant is a quarter plus minus a quarter. Sorry, the determinant is zero is even better, right? The determinant is zero. Um, and the trace is one. So we know it's a positive matrix by the arguments I've applied above. 
just to, so you can get practice at this style of reasoning that's going to happen really a lot in the, in the coming, coming weeks. While you're taking your sip, uh, just a quick question here. Please. Um, when you say positive, this would be what in mathematics we call a positive sentiment. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I always do this. Thank right. you for the clarification. So, yeah. so you, you do allow a zero eigenvalue. We do allow zero eigenvalues. I apologize. That's important. Yeah, that's um, that, that's, that's, that as actually was a mistake. It's not, it's not just terminology. I just said the wrong thing for up to now. Whenever I said positive, I should have been saying um, positive semi-definite. I mean, your, your, your matrix F there clearly has a zero eigenvalue. It clearly has a zero eigenvalue, so it's actually not positive in the sense, even mathematically, right. yeah. Um, th many thanks for the clarification. That's a shame that I made that mistake. Um, okay, that's how we model measurements in quantum mechanics. Measurements are mathematically modeled by positive operators that also have the property that one minus the operator is positive. That's how it's modeled. Now we come to the next, uh, and uh, that's great, right? So I've told you about preparations, I've told you about measurements, but I haven't told you how to get predictions out of quantum mechanics yet. This is, you, you know, this is a pretty boring theory. We can model preparations and measurements, but we can't put them together, right? What, what brings these two uh, uh, pieces of information together to give us an actual living, breathing physical theory? The answer is we need another postulate. And this is postulate four. Now this is, this is where we've got ourselves a real physical theory now. We actually don't need postulates five and six. It turns out postulates one to four are sufficient to, um, to, uh, to build up quantum mechanics as a theory, physical theory, and postulate fives and six, which I'll talk, talk about later, are convenience postulates. We, we just put them in for convenience because we can't be bothered to rederive everything. But postulates one to four are actually already enough. Okay, if you... Now, now we're going to do physics. This is it. Enough, enough math. We're going, to, we're going to do some real physics now. The detection rate of a detector modeled by some matrix F on a system prepared, right? We've mentioned now detection and preparations. According to rho, right? Preparations are these density matrices. Detections are these matrix matrices F. So detection rate of a detector modeled by F on a system prepared according to rho um, um, is given by P, uh, we'll call it click. When does our detector click? Well, with a certain probability, and that probability is given by the trace of rho multiplied by f. That's it. Now we've, we're doing physics now. We've got, we've got a way to model preparations. We've got a way to model measurements. Now we can find out if a given preparation will lead to a given detection outcome and at what rate. And the, the rate is determined by this formula here. This is the most important formula version of the Born rule, quantum mechanics, you need this formula if you're ever going to do anything with quantum mechanics. And we'll see that there's so much th that's buried into this formula that's of relevance in quantum computation. Because in quantum computation, we're always going to be facing the challenge of getting information out of our system. We can put it in with a preparation, we can set up a detection, and the only way to get information out is via a measurement and the rate of clicks that we get. So if we do a preparation and then uh, we do a measurement, then we determine or we get a click outcome with probability given by trace of rho times f. So let's do an example. By the way, I will distribute these notes um, probably by email. So we're going to go back to our friend the qubit. A qubit, we're going to describe our preparation and our measurement. Preparation. So let's imagine we prepare our qubit in the state, oh, I don't know, a half, a half, a half, a half. This is a pure state. And let's suppose we, we 
we, th we want to measure this, this qubit state and find out with what probability does our detector click. So the detector, what detector are we going to use? Well, there was a nice one that I wrote up above, 1, 0, 0, 0. And so we have a preparation, we have a detector, we have the experiment now, we can draw the experiment. So in comes the preparation. We need to prepare the state rho, so we give a description to our experimental friend, and they give us rho, uh, 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 they, uh, they construct an apparatus which can prepare the qubit in the state rho, and then nothing happens, and then we measure. And we measure with our detector F, the so-called sigma z measurement, and in fact, if you go to the IBM uh, quantum experience, and you ask to prepare your, your qubit rho in the state, and you want to do a sigma z measurement, you will get um, an outcome of click with a probability. Let's work out what that probability is. So the probability that you get a click when you prepare your system and then measure it in this way is given by postulate 3 by trace of rho. So rho is a half, a half, a half, a half times by f, f is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, okay? That's the probability with which you get a click. And if you multiply these matrices out, we get a half, 0, a half, 0, we get a half. So half the time, when you prepared your qubit in this way, and you measure it with this measurement, you'll get a click, and the other half is no click. So that's that's our first quantum mechanical experiment, prepared and mo uh, modeled and measured. And you can go ahead, um, if you're willing to learn the interface for the IBM quantum experience, and actually uh, carry this out on a real quantum computer, if you wish. And you will get a list of zeros and ones, um, and that's the number of times the detector clicked or didn't click. So that's something that is well worth doing, uh, so much worth doing, that, um, I'm going to give it as a homework. Now that's a real challenge homework. I don't expect you to be able to just do this instant, instantly. Um, but I think with a bit of sort of fiddling around and dragging, and it's got a lovely drag and drop interface, you, you'll be able to carry out that experiment yourself. And that's really like a real experiment. It's actually happening on a real quantum computer. Um, this, this experiment, and you'll, you'll get clicks and no clicks, and you could look at the empiric rate at which you get the clicks and no clicks, and you should end up with about a half. So that's, like, already we've done enough now. I've already told you super simplified quantum mechanics. That was super simplified quantum mechanics. In this version of quantum mechanics, we don't have dynamics, we just have measurements and preparations. And it turns out that's actually enough, right? You can actually, with a bit of reasoning and argumentation, uh, argue that the next two postulates are actually somehow um, by no means independent. Uh, but they're, they're so convenient that I'm gonna tell you them as postulates so we don't have to prove them. And uh, then you can just you know, believe me, and apply them. Now, it's worth saying that we have these postulates, and uh, they tell you the mathematical rules for how to model these things, but they don't tell you how to model these things, right? So suppose you have an experimentalist friend, and they said, I can do the widget measurement and the, 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 the blee blap preparation. What's the right matrix, and what's the right F? What's the right density matrix and the right F for the for, to model this this experiment by your experimentalist friend? And the answer is, well, based on experience. And so what you need to do as a working quantum computer, com computer theorist is build up a dictionary of commonly applied preparations and measurements. So this is vital. Um, uh, in fact, I better say that right now.
There are a, a list of really commonly um, applied preparations and measurements that people use in practice. Now I'll write out a couple of them. Basically, we're going to learn them sort of on the job uh, as, as we go by in these lectures. Uh, and I won't really take so much time to, uh, to give you the full comprehensive list because once you understand the, the, the general shape of one of these commonly applied preparations and measurements, you'll no longer really, mm, you won't bother to remember this as a dictionary. You'll actually learn that Postulate 5 helps you to remember this list of commonly applied preparations and measurements. So here's, uh, here's, here's the, the, the vital list. I'll give it to you now. There's the so-called X preparation. Um, where rho is given by a half, a half, a half, a half. There's the Y preparation, where I don't even think I could remember it correctly. Um, I believe it's a half, sigma Y to be plus one. So I believe it's minus a half I, a half I. And then there's the Z preparation, where rho equals one, zero, zero, zero. You just have to remember these. Um, you, as you learn more quantum mechanics and you get more experience with it, it gets easier and easier somehow to uh, know which preparation is being talked about at which time. And then here comes the, de the, the detections or measurements. You got to, There's a corresponding to each one of these preparations, there's a measurement operator. Just so it turns out, they're the same thing. So that was pretty easy, right? So uh, F equals uh, rho here, call this rho x to, to, to make it clear that this has got something to do with these letters x, y, and z. Um, the, the, the y measurement F equals rho y, and the z measurement F equals rho z. I want to stress that although F looks like it's also like a density oper operator, it doesn't have to have trace one. So uh, this, this weird duality between these two things goes away very quickly. Okay, here's your list of basic preparations and measurements in quantum mechanics. You can go ahead and sort of do nine experiments this way, right? You can try all forms of preparing, preparing and measuring to see what comes out. You can prepare your system in the X preparation and measure the Y measurement and see what comes out. You can prepare in the Z and measure the X and see what comes out. So you have nine kind of possible preparations and measurements. Now, as I said, we don't, in practice, we often don't memorize these preparations and measurements. Instead, we have two additional postulates which really help us um, in minimizing the surface area of stuff that we have to remember when we're trying to do quantum mechanics. And so now we come to postulate five. Uh, and this is one where there's going to be a little bit of physics um, creeping in. Um, I'll try and keep the physics at bay uh, so we don't get bogged down in too much uh, physical discussion that isn't relevant to quantum computation, but this is, this is not unrelevant. Mm. Actually, I don't think I'm going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. Evolution. Okay, I'm going to describe it slightly differently. There's going to be a new word here, closed. quantum circuits already. The evolution of a closed quantum system is described by a unitary matrix U, and U has to act on our Hilbert space. 
Now, maybe you, you don't remember what a unitary matrix is. A unitary matrix is one where if you take the adjoint, multiply it by u, you get the i, and that is the same as if you do u times u dagger. Now, any quantum, what does closed mean? Closed means that the quantum system is effectively completely shielded from the environment. What's the environment? Well, everything that's not the quantum system, right? So the qubit, perhaps if we're thinking about a qubit, has to be sort of hermetically sealed in some kind of chamber and no, um, nothing from the environment is allowed to interact with the qubit if we're, gonna, uh, if we're in a closed, an example of a closed quantum system. The minute we do a measurement on a quantum system, we're actually interacting with it. That's very crucial. The only way information can get out of a quantum system is by a measurement. And the minute you do a measurement, this quantum system is no longer closed. You open up a little window and you take a look in. And by looking in, you're interacting with the system. This is something that you should get used to. In quantum mechanics, information gain leads to uh, disturbance of the system. That's a, uh, that's a physical um, uh, truism in quantum mechanics. Remember it, I'm not gonna write it down here, but gaining information disturbs the quantum system uh, and gaining information you do so by measurement. But if you don't measure the system, if you gain no information about the quantum system, then the evolution of the system is described always by a unitary matrix U. This turns out to be really crucial, this, this, this distinction between evolution and information gain and closedness. All right, so the evolution of a closed quantum system is described by a unitary matrix. Um, and we describe evolutions in one of two equivalent ways. We could do uh, either in the so-called Schrodinger picture where your preparation gets updated to a new preparation. And what's the new preparation after the, the system has evolved? Well, the new preparation um, is U rho U dagger. So after the evolution takes place, you can describe the system as being really equivalent to the system whereby we've just uh, prepared it in a different quantum state, different density matrix. What density matrix? Well, the one where you've taken the old one and you've multiplied it by u, rho, u dagger. Or um, in the Heisenberg picture, whereby we update our detector operator. So the detection that we're gonna do gets mapped to a new one, F prime, U dagger U F U. So you either implement your evolution in the Schrodinger picture where you, you model the system as having um, uh, been prepared in the new state row prime, or you model it in the Heisenberg picture where you say, the preparation is the preparation, that doesn't change, but the, uh, the device that we detect the system with is now effectively re replaced with another one. As we'll see, these two uh, ways of implementing evolution lead to the same outcome, the same probability, so we can never tell operationally. There's no way, no way to set up an experiment that could tell if it happened in the Schrodinger picture or the Heisenberg picture. Let me give you uh, this picture here. I've shown you at the beginning. Now we'll do it again. Remember, preparations are modeled by density matrices. Detections are modeled by uh, operators F and dynamics are modeled by U and according we can now apply um, the, uh, the postulates 1 to 4 to work out the probability that we get a click either in the Schrodinger picture or in the Heisenberg picture. Schrodinger, let's do the probability of a click now. Well, that's trace of, well, I told you that the, the preparation in the Schrodinger picture, the way dynamics works or evolutions, or allowed evolutions work in quantum mechanics is that you have to change your preparation. So the new preparation is U prime, and that's given by U rho U dagger times by F. So the probability that you get a click for this experiment is given by trace of U rho U dagger F. Um, that's if you do things in the Heisenberg picture. And then the picture that you have in mind is that uh, really, you're like, you know, I'm just thinking about the, 
the preparation and the dynamics is just being another preparation. U prime, rho prime. So I effectively like incorporate the dynamics of the, the apparatus into the preparation. That's, an, that's one way of thinking in the Schrodinger picture. But in the Heisenberg picture, you think differently. You think, oh, no, 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 no. The right way to think about it is that the preparation is the preparation, but what really changes is the way I'm measuring the system. I'm just measuring it with respect to a different angle, so to speak. So the Heisenberg way of thinking, which is equivalent, is that the probability of a click is given by the trace of, well, the preparation is the preparation, but it's now a new measurement that we're doing, a new detection, and that's given by u dagger f u. But if you look, these two things are absolutely the same number, right? Because all I have to do is apply the cyclic rule of trace to bring that u around here, and that equals the, the, the number up above. So these two ways of thinking, although they're sort of psychologically extremely different, right? You know, one way you imagine that you're slowly changing your preparation bit by bit, and then you just do a fixed measurement, or the other way of thinking, where you, you, you imagine that you're just changing preparations, but you're always, so you're changing your detections, and the preparation remains the same. These ways of thinking are psychologically very different for humans. Physically, they, they lead to the same results, according to the postulates of quantum mechanics. Let me now give you uh, a list of uh, some, ex uh, some examples, right? We, we need to do examples. Uh, to get some feeling for these postulates. And here, I'm going to write down the commonly used unitary gates in quantum computation. I'm going to write them all down. And so these, uh, you just heard me say unitary gates, right? So now there's a clue there, right? All quantum circuits are in quantum mechanics. What are quantum circuits? Well, they're just evolutions of closed quantum systems. That's, when you hear now the, the, the words quantum circuit, you should just think, that's an evolution of a closed quantum system. They're equivalent things. So let's, let's go through the laundry list of all quantum gates. I'm going to start drawing pictures without defining this notation, but you'll get used to the pictures. So here's evolution according to X. Pauli X it's called. Got to get used to this notation. Pauli X is the matrix U equals 0, 0, 1, 1, like that. Is it unitary? Well, that's an exercise for you, but I hope you can do that sort of while I'm writing. Here's another evolution in quantum circuits. It's called Pauli Y. Now, I'll give it the notation that you're going to see used. Sigma X is the name for this unitary matrix. Um, is the notation you're going to see. Sigma Y is the notation for this unitary matrix. Here's a unitary matrix. Um, here's another quantum circuit. It's called Pauli Z. So you're going to start to see these, these examples get used all, all the time in quantum computation. So there's three matrices. You can check at your leisure that these three matrices are unitary. They're all allowed, but there's more, right? To do quantum mechanics, we're going to need a handful more. We're going to need the so-called Hadamard gate. Okay, the Hadamard gate is this two by two matrix. Why, the, why this one and not another? Historical reasons. Five, we're going to need the so-called T gate or pi on eight gate. And that one I have to look up. Um, because I never remember the phase. And typically I haven't written it down. Ah, oh, damn. All right, I don't know. Uh, the T gate, I believe, is 1, 0, 0, here we go, e to the pi i on 4. Someone yell out if that was the wrong gate. Okay, I hope that was the correct gate. Um, That's correct. It is correct? Fantastic. Okay. And the last gate you're going to need to know to do quantum mechanics is, well... So, sorry, I, I, I may... Oh, no, no, it's correct. I just thought there was a minus or something. All right. Okay. 
Great. Then one more gate. And this one, so, so far I've just been talking about qubits, right? You know, H is C2 for this whole discussion. But in the last gate, I'm going to talk about a new system, C to the 4. Turns out this is the Hilbert space for two qubits, but I haven't told you how to do that yet. But we can still talk about a quantum system whose Hilbert space is of type C4. In this case, we've got another gate, which has this picture. Um, but as a matrix, U is uh, a 4 by 4 matrix. It's got to be a unitary. It's got to act on the Hilbert space C to the 4. And it's this matrix here. This is called the C not or control not gate. Okay, there we go. That's a list of possible evolutions of closed quantum systems. And uh, now we come to the last postulate of quantum mechanics. Okay, it's... I'm sorry, may I ask something? Please. Hey, could you say once again, what do you mean by evolution? What do I mean by evolution? Yes, that's actually a, a, a horribly deep question. Um, I, <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. Okay, uh, what do I really mean by evolution? Okay, firstly, we have to uh, have a notion of closedness of the quantum system. So that's, that's at least critical. You know, we have to decide, is the system closed or not? Okay. Um, and then a, a, an evolution is anything that that system does once it's closed, if you wait some time. Does that help? Yes, it helps. Yeah, and so if you're an experimentalist, and I know some of you have an experimental background, uh, it turns out you can kind of cheat, right? You can get, um, you can engineer your quantum systems to do pre-specified evolutions by being quite clever about how you set up your experiment. So you ensure that the system is closed, but closed in such a way that it does the unitary matrix that you want it to do. And that, you know, involves shining lasers at the right angles and with the right coherences and so on. Lots of hard work. I don't want to diminish the effort of experimentalists in making these evolutions happen. Um, but you have to, uh, at this stage, we just say that evolutions are things that happen when you close a quantum system off from the environment and you leave it alone for a time. So, but that could be, for example, a change in, in space time? Like if, uh, hmm. uh, if you have, a, a, I don't know, an electron in a box or something like yes. that? So, an electron in a box, y y y as long as the box is hermetically sealed from the environment, um, then the electron is going to like evolve. It's, its wave function is going to spread out, right? That's, a, that's an evolution. That's an allowed evolution. It's described by a unitary operator on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Mm. Uh, uh, electrons actually don't fit into simplified quantum mechanics. We, we don't allow them. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're too complicated. Um, uh, but that's indeed, that's, 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 that's an example, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, welcome. Good, we're almost done. Like I see the time's now 4.30 and that's maybe, the, we're heading to the right timing because I'm gonna tell you the last postulate of quantum mechanics, postulate six. And this one's, uh, this one's, this is, this is one where we're gonna need a little bit of linear algebra that you may not be familiar with. So I've told you that to every quantum system of a certain type, you have to assign a Hilbert space. But what if you have two quantum systems? Or, you know, many quantum systems and you bring them together. So if you have a qubit and you have another qubit, um, separately they're qubits, separately they're modeled by this Hilbert space C2. But if you bring them together, then the, the compound system of the two qubits is also a quantum system and according to the laws of quantum mechanics. So there must be a Hilbert space for it, which is the right Hilbert space for this uh, composite quantum system. Well, the answer is the Hilbert space is by a so-called tensor product. So you've got you know, a bunch of your favorite quantum systems that each modeled by, separately by a Hilbert space. Uh, what's the correct Hilbert space to assign to the compound system? The answer is H is given by H1 tensor, the scary symbol, H2 tensor, H3 tensor, blah, 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 all the way up to N. Okay, that's 
uh, at this point, uh, if we were doing this mathematically rigorously, we would have to take a digression of several weeks to explain this tensor, the mathematical properties of this tensor product. I'm not going to do that. Instead, um, I'm going to do a couple of, che of sneaky cheats. Um, one is you might already know about the Kronecker product, um, in which case uh, you can forget the words tensor product and just use your knowledge about Kronecker products. And the other is I'm just going to do some examples until you kind of get the rules, right? Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to be setting up the full definition of this tensor product because we're only interested in, in quantum, quantum computation with one example and we're kind of laser-like focused on this example of n qubits. So we're always going to be focusing on quantum systems that are composed of one or more qubits. And I'll be able to explicitly tell you what is the right Hilbert space for n qubits. It's pretty easy. Um, and I'll do it right now. So, so you don't ever have to worry. You, you'll, you'll learn the rules quickly anyway. And, um, but at this stage, it's, it's important not to get hung up about this definition. Just be, be pragmatic about its application. So for n qubits, well, h1 equals h2. You know, they're all qubits, so they're all modeled by c to the 2. And so then, what on earth is this h? Well, it's c2 tensor, c2 tensor, blah, 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 n times. What does this mean? Well, actually, it turns out this vector space here is exactly given by c to the 2 to the n. And I'll explain the rules now for how to build vectors in this bigger Hilbert space, how to reason about them, and then oh, we've done the, the postulates of quantum mechanics. So let's do that. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll just work, basically I'm just going to work from examples, build up these examples until you have really enough information to start extrapolating mentally about how, the, how you should reason about the things in this Hilbert space H. Um, okay, let's take n is 2. Okay, let's take two vectors. Phi is a vector, not a state. Now, phi is a vector. Psi. Uh, uh, phi is a vector like, I don't know, 1, 2. And psi is the vector uh, i, i. Now, to build up elements of this weird tensor product space, what do you do? Well, you take the tensor product. So there's a way to, to take given a vector in one Hilbert space, a vector describing another qubit, uh, no, sorry, a vector in this other Hilbert space attached to the second qubit. We can build up a bigger vector. What's the rule? Well, I mean, it has to be, we know it has to live in C2 to the 2, which is C to the 4. Um, and the rule is, well, uh, you, you may have seen this. So what you do is you take the first entry here, phi, and you multiply it by the entire vector psi in the following fashion. So it's 1 times by psi, which is i, i. And then you take 2, so this is, uh, and then you take the second entry, 2, and you multiply it by psi again. So this weird looking operation gives us a 4 by 1 vector, and the vector is i, i, 2, i, 2, i. Okay. That's how to compute the tensor product of two vectors. Um, and what happens if you have three vectors? Well, you just do this again, right? You, d you first compute the tensor product of two, two of them, and then you do it again. So I'll actually do that example. Um, so what about, what happens if I had phi tensor psi tensor phi like that. How would I reason about that thing? That's in a bigger, this is n is 3. This vector is given by an 8 by 8 uh, vector. What we do is we work out that vector first. Oh, we've done that already. That's great. Um, and then we apply the rule above again. So we get, uh, I'll do it this way, I suppose. We get 1, no, the first entry of phi, and multiply it by this whole vector i, i, 2, i, 2, i, then 2, i, i, 2, i, 2, i. So we get an 8 
vector, a vector with eight entries, i, i, 2i, 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 4i, 4i. And that's an element of c to the 2 to the 3, which is otherwise c to the 8. So I've just told you the, the, the rudiments of how this, this symbol tensor works. If you've got vectors like this, then the rule is you take the whole vector and multiply it by the first entry and stack it on top of the whole vector multiplied by the second entry. That's the rule for applying this tensor symbol. And with that way, you, you gain access to zillions of vectors in this tensor product Hilbert space. Uh, what about matrices? So it turns out if you... Sorry, Tobias. Yep. What about if you would do it the other way around? If you would have that this, this first product and then you could spy in the end? Ooh, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Let's do it because you asked the question because there must be some ambiguity in what I said. So let's see. Um, like that, yeah? Mm. Okay. Can I cheat a bit? Yeah, I can. So I'll do this one first. Ah, yeah, okay, now I see where the question's coming from. Actually, it's a good question. Um, all right, so let's write out that, that, that vector here. That, that we, we got it there here. I, I, 2, I, 2, I, tensor, phi, which is 1, 2. Now we look up above. How do we do this trick? So what we do is we take the first entry and multiply it by the second vector and stack it. So I'll, I'll try and... I'll do it like this, right? So what we do is we take the first entry multiply it by the whole vector and then stack it up on top of the second entry, multiply it by this vector and stack it up and so on. So I'll just do it and then you might, might help you. So i times by the whole vector, so that's i, 2i. Then i multiplied by the whole vector, that's i, 2i. Then we've got... Uh, can just do the same thing actually? Yep. Alright. Exactly. So that's how we would do that tensor product there. Okay. So it's a good okay. question. Um, yeah, basically I'm outsourcing to the questions all the, all the rules of the tensor product symbol. Um, already with this recipe, you'll have started to detect some, some patterns and rules. For example, if I take a vector and I multiply it by a scalar factor, like, so if I do phi tensor psi, but I have like some scalar number z, so z is a complex number. You know, imagine I work out, first I multiply the, the column vector psi by z, and then I do the tensor product. It turns out that's just the same, right? If you, if you go through the rules above as first doing the tensor product and multiplying it by that, that scalar number and so on. There's a whole bunch of rules that I, I leave it to you to work out. Um, uh, and you'll gain experience with these rules. What about if I have two vectors and I add them first and then take their tensor product? Well, it turns out that the tensor product is really, there's a reason why it's got a multiply symbol it sort of acts like a multiply symbol. And so this is really um, exactly equal to the sum of these two vectors. So you can work one out, um, work out the first tensor product, work out the second one, then add them. That rule is ab absolutely okay. And how would you do this in a, lang in a programming language? So many of you might be not as old as me, but um, if you are, you may have experienced MATLAB. Um, and this tensor, uh, tensor notation in MATLAB, you can actually um, implement with the so-called cron function. And I would do this in MATLAB like this. So in MATLAB, MATLAB does this for you. So you, uh, you don't have to do the stacking up and multiplying things. MATLAB will be quite happy to supply you with this tensor product in MATLAB. I don't know about NumPy the Python implementation. Is it called cron there as well? Probably, right? Um, but any decent programming language with a numerical linear algebra uh, routine uh, will give you a Kronecker product or tensor product operation. So, so far I've just, yes. it's called NumPy, it's also called cron, is that right? Exactly. Oh, fantastic, yes. okay, then, then you haven't, uh, I haven't told you any lies. That's great. Okay, and so there's, well, there's lots of programming languages, whatever ones it takes your fancy, you should use. Um, uh, but probably most of you will be, in, as you get into quantum computation, you'll be exposed to uh, quantum libraries that are based on Python, right? This is somehow inevitable these days. 
is this KISS kit that's um, very popular right now as a way to model quantum systems in quantum computation. There's also Penny Lane um, and dot, 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 dot. Uh, there's a growing list of libraries with which you can model quantum circuits and they should all, if they're decently written, give you some version of this tensor product operation. Now I've only explained this tensor product operation for vectors. I haven't in, in fact told you how to take the tensor products of matrices or of states and so on. So we're almost done. Um, how do you take the tensor product of matrices? Well, it turns out you, there shouldn't be too many surprises for you uh, now that you've seen uh, the, the, the vectors case. So suppose we have two ve Hilbert spaces, that's two vector spaces, we have two matrices. Let's be super explicit, like, you know, A is 1, 1, 1, 2, um, and B, just to make things spicy, will be a 3 by 3 matrix, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. How do I work out? Um, uh, there is a rule that tells you how to build a matrix that represents doing applying A on the first Hilbert space and B on the second Hilbert space. And uh, the rule is pretty much an, a uh, version of what I've just showed you. So one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. So what you do is you take the one, one entry, oops, multiply it by the entire matrix B, oops, and then stick it in the appropriate place. So you do, uh, I'll just go ahead and write out this. So we get one, times by two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And then we take the second entry, one, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. And then we get, well, another one. And then two. That's how you build up this tensor product of A and B. This is also, by the way, in MATLAB or I guess Python written cron A, B. So now we have a rule that if we have a, a matrix acting on a smaller vector space and another one, we can build a matrix that acts on the tensor product of those vector spaces. Uh, and you can quickly reason by way of examples that these this tensor product symbol behaves well pretty much exactly like I've described above for vectors. Because vectors, by the way, are just examples of matrices, right? Matrices with many rows and one column. Okay, so now I've, I've given you a whirlwind um, tour of the tensor product by way of examples, and we're finally done because we can now describe um, how to uh, model quantum circuits. And we've got to apply the postulates of quantum mechanics in turn, right? So every one of my students gets used to going through the list of postulates every time they consider a new quantum system. And, um, and then after a while, you, you just get better and better at remembering them and you don't ever write them down ever again. But for the first few times that you model a quantum system, you should go through the postulates. So what does postulate one tell us? Postulate one tells us that a qubit should be attached to a Hilbert space C to the two. But if you combine that now with postulate six, then the right Hilbert space for N qubits um, is actually C2 tends to C2, blah, 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 N times. Now postulate two talks about preparations. Um, well, what's a valid preparation? A valid preparation is a density matrix. And this density matrix acts on this very high dimensional vector space. It's worth saying that the dimension of n qubits, what's the dimension that is a vector space? Well, it's two to the n, right? So if you have every qubit you add, you double the dimension of this vector space, this underlying vector space. So preparations are density matrices. They're two to the n by two to the n matrices. Oh my gosh, how can we work with these things? This is a this is in fact 
in fact, part of the power of quantum computers that a quantum computer can, with linear experimental cost, add in qubits, and therefore uh, simulate the, uh, the, the application and manipulation of very large matrices. Now, um, it turns out to be very difficult to reason about these large matrices in general, but what we do is we have this list of fundamental or basic um, preparations that we're allowed to do. And one of them is you separately uh, prepare your quantum system, separately prepare your qubits. And then the correct uh, uh, state describing the joint compound system is then given by the tensor product. So you separately prepare the qubits uh, in row one in this list of density of matrices here. These are all acting on C, they're all two by two matrices, right? And then what's the correct preparation um, for the full system? The full preparation is then described by the tensor product. Rho is given by one tensor, rho one, tensor rho two, tensor rho three, it quickly becomes a nightmare to write this matrix out. Like nobody, when n is four or a five, people stop writing out these matrices as in matrix form because it just becomes so unwieldy to do so. Um, okay, I will do it though, um, in the case of n is two. Let's prepare our state in an X. So qubit one gets prepared in the x preparation and qubit 2 in uh, z preparation. What's the correct way to describe the global preparation of the system? Well, the global preparation, you know, separately preparing them, is the same as uh, taking the tensor product of their preparations. That's what um, the definition above says. And that means that we got to take the tensor product of this matrix, a half, a half, a half, a half, and one, zero, 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 zero. Okay, that's what the global, uh, the whole system of two qubits, it's now described by this density matrix here. What does that matrix look like? Well, I'm going to work it out explicitly for you. It's a half, zero, zero, zero. It's a half, zero, 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 a half, zero, 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 and a half, zero, 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 like so. That's the actual matrix that gets prepared uh, if you separately prepare the qubits. And I leave it to you as a little homework to do qubit one in the Z. Well, let's put it in the X. Uh, so we'll do three qubits. Qubit two goes into a Y and a qubit three gets prepared into a Z preparation. That's a, yeah, well, it's not a totally trivial matrix to write out. It's an eight by eight matrix. Um, you can check it with MATLAB if you're concerned that you may have made a mistake. Okay, so that's, that's how to do postulate two when we have more than one qubit. What we generally do is we, in order to keep the problem uh, easily to describe, is we separately prepare the subsystems, the qubits. We form the, 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 describe the full preparation with this tensor product. And then, and only then, um, do we start doing operations on the system. So I won't talk about measurements, postulates um, three and four. We'll just leave them for the moment. I'd rather focus on postulate five because that's where the quantum circuits are. Now, this is sort of winding up for today with the final definition of how a quantum circuit acts. A quantum circuit is an evolution of a closed quantum system, so it's a unitary matrix, according to postulate five. It's a unitary U that acts on a Hilbert space to a Hilbert space. So what is it? Well, it's a two to the N by two to the N unitary matrix 
Now you've already begun to get a sense of how difficult it is to write down these matrices, right? These two to the n by two to the n matrices. So we have a very neat shorthand way to describe quantum circuits, which doesn't require us to write out the full matrix. And for that, we use quantum circuit notation to specify certain unitary procedures that you can do. Uh, and I've already started to introduce this quantum circuit notation. Um, so I better tell you some, some of the rules, right? Okay, so if, a, if we have the Hilbert space of n qubits, then I've got to tell you some basic rules. for how to understand this quantum circuit notation. Firstly, doing nothing, what does that mean? Well, doing nothing is represented by n horizontal lines. Doing nothing is a very important operation in physics and is represented by the identity operator, tensor the identity operator, da 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 da, n times, which is you know, one zero zero one, tensor one zero zero one, tensor dot dot dot. But that's actually just a really big identity matrix, right? It's a two to the n by two to the n uh, identity matrix. So doing nothing is a fundamental primitive in quantum circuits. You need to be able to represent it as a unitary matrix. You need to have some a pictorial notation to describe it. And that's it there. The next notation we have is do a single qubit unitary, it's called. So a single qubit unitary is a unitary that acts on a single qubit, but doing a single qubit unitary is the same as doing nothing on the other qubits. So you choose your favorite qubit, call it qubit J, and then uh, you do a unitary on that qubit and you do nothing on the rest. What's the operation to uh, represented by this sentence and graphically by the following circuit? So you do nothing on qubit one, you do nothing on qubit two, do nothing on qubit three, but on qubit J, you do the unitary. And on J plus one, we do nothing. So the unitary represented by this circuit and therefore an allowed evolution of a closed quantum system is given by the following unitary. You do tensor product of the two by two identity. I'll just write it out, okay? One, zero, zero, one. One, zero, zero, one, right? For every qubit, you do nothing individually until you come to the jth qubit. And then you do the two by two unitary and then you do nothing until the end. Okay, that's, that's the unitary matrix that represents doing a single qubit unitary. Very important unitary matrix. We're almost done. In fact, we only have one more unitary matrix to describe and your, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll cheat a bit. Doing C naught on two qubits. Okay, what does it mean to do C naught on neighboring qubits? Well, here's the picture. We do nothing on one to two, but on qubit J, there's a picture for doing C naught. It has the following diagram. You've got a kind of a plus symbol joined with a line to a dot on the j qubit, but then you do nothing on the j plus two qubit and so on. What's the unitary matrix that represents doing C naught on neighboring qubits? Well, I'm hoping you're starting to spot the pattern by now. It's one zero zero one, tensor one zero zero one, tensor dot 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 dot, all the way up to, and then you have the C naught gate which is a unitary operator, which is a four by four matrix. And this is, you know, on factor one, factor two, and then this is on factor 
j and j plus 1, qubits j and j plus 1. So the unitary which represents doing C nut on neighboring qubits j and j plus 1 is given by this big, big matrix here. I won't attempt to write it down. I mean, you just quickly learn not to do that because it's too spatially demanding. Um, there's one operation we're going to need before I can tell you a very important theorem. Um, and then we can sort of draw today's uh, discussion to a close. And that is uh, swap. There's a new, there's a special kind of unitary called swap. Uh, swap is the, the following two by two matrix. 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And it does what you think it does. It swaps qubits j and j plus 1, or two, two qubits. Uh, in, uh, in circuit notation, it looks like this. And you can imagine what do swap on j and j plus 1 means. What does this mean? Well, in, in circuit notation, we draw this picture. And the corresponding unitary operation is this one. Da, 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 da. 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Right? So now I've listed, given you a laundry list of basic unitaries that uh, you can define on n qubits, and I've given you a way, uh, I've given you the recipe for how to build up the 2 to the n by 2 to the n unitary matrix, so the doing nothing, doing a single qubit unitary, doing a C naught on neighboring pairs, and doing a swap on neighboring pairs. And now comes an amazing theorem. So this is a, uh, we can even prove this theorem not today, but uh, I can describe for you, to you the entire argument. It's, it's a very beautiful theorem um, in, in the coming weeks. Theorem, for all unitaries, I'll write it like this. All unitaries, uh, U acting on n qubits, So this is where this is where quantum computation becomes computation right now. This is the so-called universality result. Um, may be represented as a product of how many many um, uh, fundamental unitary. Uh, quantum circuits, I will not get this bit right, as a product of, uh, or I believe it's 2 to the 2 to the n, question mark, exclamation mark, of uh, of quantum gates, Aha, I didn't introduce this terminology yet, mm. Sorry, just put that in here. So unitaries one through four that I've just described above are called primitive, it, that's my notation, so I'll delete that. Um, they're called quantum gates. All of these things here are examples of quantum gates. Examples one and two are examples of uh, single qubit gates, like doing nothing is like just doing nothing on qubit j. So these are called single qubit gates. They're allowed evolutions of closed quantum systems. Doing C naught on neighboring qubits is a two qubit gate, right? We've got qubit j and j plus one, something happens to them. Swap is a two qubit gate. Unitaries one to four, they're all examples of quantum gates. So this is terminology, right? It's nothing's changed, they're just unitaries, but we they're special kinds of unitaries, ones that we think we can apply in experiments with less cost. And now comes this amazing theorem. It says that no matter what unitary you want to do, so if you have some unitary, your favorite unitary on n qubits, big 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix, and you wonder, 
how could I do this unitary in, a, in an experiment? Well, the answer is you can by uh, multiplying a certain sequence of single and two qubit gates. Um, as a product of on single and two well, as a product of single and two qubit gates. So you know you have your favorite unitary u that you want to implement for whatever reason. It's a two to the n by two to the n matrix. And it turns out, turns out that no matter what u you choose, I mean, there's you know, potentially two to the uh, two n complex numbers there. You can always represent that as a product of gates of single and two qubit gates. Dot, 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 right. And which gates do you need to, to bring under consideration? You know, which gates will appear in the sequence? It turns out only a finite set. Even with a finite set of single and two qubit gates, you have enough gates to express any unitary as a product. And the gates you need uh, in order to express any unitary, so this is universality, are uh, the Hadamard gate, the T gate, the C not gate and the swap gate. With just these four gates, you can uh, represent any unitary on n qubits. This is called universality of this gate set. Now, I want to uh, contrast this observation with one that you possibly know from classical computer science. Um, you may know that the NAND gate is universal for classical computation, meaning that any Boolean operation can be expressed as a composition of NAND gates. This, is the, this, this result I've just described here is the analog of this result in classical computer science. So the NAND gate, right, you know, is this gate here with the following truth table, um, x, y, z. Oops x, y, z, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So it's the, the not of the and, so it's that, right? So it, you can express any Boolean function in classical computer science as a composition of m multiple NAND gates, right? That's the NAND gate by itself is sufficient to carry out any computation classically. And here we have just seen the quantum analog of this. Any unitary you want to do, that's any allowed operation in, for a closed, uh, any allowed evolution for a closed quantum system is a unitary. Any unitary you care to do can be implemented as a product of single and two qubit gates. And the gates you need really, you could boil them down to this one of these four. So although the NAND gate doesn't appear in that list, we have these other gates, but these are by themselves sufficient to express any operation in quantum mechanics on n qubits. So this is a, um, a high point in the theory of quantum computation, that these gates are comp uh, computationally universal. And it's the one that we can, uh, that allows us to build, to use the quantum circuit abstraction um, as a useful abstraction. So, it, you know, this quantum circuits that I've drawn here with lines and dots and boxes and so on, this is a useful um, diagrammatic abstraction because of this universality result, right? We're guaranteed that any unitary we want to apply will be written as a product of these gates. Can I ask a question? Please. So how do you do nothing? Uh, you just, <laughs> it's really a good question. So experimentally doing nothing is super hard. Like you have to. But I mean, with these four matrices, like if you just have a two by two, then you do need it. Yeah, right. So a two by two matrix that does nothing is this matrix here, the identity matrix. But it's not one of the four. Oh, oh uh, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm gonna get out of this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question actually. Um, it's not one of the four. Well, it turns out that if you take t to the power four, that's the identity matrix, right? So 
T is this matrix, 1, 0, 0, e to the pi i on 4, sorry, uh, 8, right? So if you take that matrix to the power 8, so you do it 8 times in composition, you'll get the number 1. And so the matrix you get out at the end is 1, 0, 0, e to the 8 pi on 4, but that's 1, 0, 0, e to the 2 pi i, which is just 1. So indeed, that's a good question. Like, how do I do nothing, the identity, without that being in our list of allowed gates? The answer is you do t eight times, which is, which is a super stupid way to do nothing. Like, a much more efficient way to do nothing, of course, is just to do nothing. Um, but no, that was an excellent question. All right. Um, I've come to the end of what I wanted to tell you about quantum computation. So I'll just scroll, zoom out. Can I have a follow-up question? About, Please. Um, so this, can that be interpre interpreted in something like um, rotating eight times and then you're at the beginning again? Or yes. Like yeah, if you're familiar with the Bloch sphere, we're doing like a, a rotation of 2 pi over 8 on the Bloch sphere. Yeah. So you do it eight times and you come around again. Perfect, thanks. So I want to take us to zoom us out and take us uh, through a sort of highly zoomed out summary of, of today's um, uh, material. So I started by telling you who this course was for, and then I introduce you to uh, simplified quantum mechanics, uh, which is a list of postulates that you apply to model mathematically any quantum system allowed in simplified quantum mechanics. And there are six postulates in all. The first postulate concerns uh, the, the playground for the quantum systems, the Hilbert space. The second postulate concerns detection, uh, sorry, preparations. Uh, how do we describe preparations? The third postulate and the fourth postulate uh, apply to measurements. How do we detect the system and get information out of it? How do we model that mathematically? Postulate five is concerned with what happens if we leave the system closed and leave it alone for a while. And postulate six tells us how to model many uh, quantum systems composed of fundamental atomic uh, quantum systems. And then I went through a list of uh, accepted a dictionary of accepted evolutions that are attached to certain names. These names are quantum gates. So quantum gates are just evolutions of closed systems. And then I introduce you to this amazing result that says that with a finite list of quantum gates, we can express any unitary as a product of these finite gates. So that's, that's where we've come from today and, and where we're going to go in the future is I'm going to show you how with a combination, a clever combination of preparations, evolutions and measurements, we can extract the answers to computational problems using fewer quantum gates than the best known classical algorithms to solve the same problems. That's called quantum computation. It's really the topic of the next talk. Um, coming in a couple of weeks, but for now, I think I'm done. Thank you very much.